Hi, this teacher is going to be a bit different to the last one and is going to be on the differential diagnoses for a patient presenting with sudden loss of vision. So the conditions we're going to be looking at for sudden loss of vision are retinal detachment and posterior vitreous detachment, central retinal artery occlusion, central retinal vein occlusion, vitreous hemorrhage, optic neuritis and anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So we're going to be looking at the presentation of each of these conditions, their investigation and their management to get a better idea of the differentials for a patient coming to us with sudden loss of their vision. So we'll start by looking at posterior vitreous detachment, which is separation of the vitreous membrane from the retina. Uh, and this isn't something that causes complete loss of vision, but it is a risk factor for things like retinal detachment. So if we start by drawing the vitreous humour in the vitreous chamber at the posterior bit of the eye. Uh, so this is full with the vitreous jelly, which is a obviously jelly-like material. And with age, this vitreous liquefies and reduces in volume. So it collapses in towards the middle, and that causes it to peel away from the neural retina at the edge. And that's what causes the vitreous detachment. And it's important to note that while it sounds like one, this is not a retinal detachment. This is detachment of the vitreous from the retina rather than the neural retina from the underlying retinal epithelium. There are a number of different risk factors for the condition. So as I said, there's age, people who are myopic, so those who are short-sighted, uveitis, intraocular surgery or laser treatment, or any trauma to the eye as well. So the patient will present with the painless appearance of multiple floaters as a result of this breakdown of the vitreous. Uh, there may be flashes in the vision if there's any traction uh, exerted on the retina as the vitreous pulls away from it. And a number of signs might be seen on examination. So there's the Weiss ring, which is a thin, irregular ring of translucent material within the vitreous humour itself on a slit lamp exam. And that's the posterior surface of the vitreous, uh, which becomes visible as it pulls away from the retina. And there might also be a hemorrhage, retinal detachment or a tear, but they might not always be there. So the management of posterior vitreous detachment, if you're not in the ophthalmology department, is to refer them to ophthalmology on the same day. And that's to have a slit lamp examination to exclude any retinal tears or detachments. Uh, if there's no pigment and no blood in the vitreous, and there's no clinical evidence of a break, then you can reassure the patient and send them home. And the floaters will probably sort of resolve over, a next few, over the next few weeks. If there are any retinal tears, they can ma be managed early on with uh, laser therapy. So next we're going to look at retinal detachment. And this is the separation of the neural retina from the retinal pigment epithelium. I've got a picture of this here to show you what that, what that means. So here you can see on the outside of the eye, at the bottom, we have scl the sclera and the choroid. And then we have the retina. So the outermost bit of the retina is the retinal pigment epithelium. Then on the inside of the eye, we have the neural retina, which is made up of the photoreceptors, horizontal cells, and the ganglion cells. And on the innermost surface of the eye, the ganglion cell axons run, and on top of them run the retinal vessels, which you can see in red here. So in a retinal detachment, the neural retina separates from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. So if we just draw the retinal pigment epithelium there in the orange, and on top of it, the neural retina, which overlies it, then we can talk about the categories of retinal detachment. So there are two main types, regmatogenous and non-regmatogenous. And non-regmatogenous can be uh, divided further into tractional and exudative. So in regmatogenous, there's a break into the retina, uh, either from vitreous traction or chronic atrophy. And this allows fluid to seep into this potential space between the neural retina and the retinal pigment epithelium, causing the retina to be lifted away. So if we just draw another retinal pigment epithelium and a neural retina on top of it, we can talk about tractional uh, retinal detachment, which is none of the, one of the non-regmatogenous causes. Uh, so in this, there's contraction of the vitreous, and this can be from neovascularization and diabetic retinopathy, where new blood vessels grow into the vitreous, causing traction on the neural retina. And as they contract, it pulls on the neural retina and pulls it away, causing the detachment. And then finally, we've got exudative, 
retinal detachment, also known as serous, and this is when damage to the retinal pigment epithelium, so underneath on the uh, lower layer, uh, allows retinal fluid to seep into the space underneath the neural retina, and that pushes the neural retina off the retinal pigment epithelium. So it doesn't pull away, it pushes away and excludes it. So just label them up so you can see what they are, and then we can talk about the risk factors. So each type of retinal detachment has different risk factors. So in regmatogenous, uh, myopic people, the people who are short-sighted, have a risk factor, and that's because they have a bigger eye. Family history, previous retinal detachment, and trauma to the eye uh, can also influence the risk of getting regmatogenous detachment. And eye trauma uh, can be several months before the detachment. Non-regmatogenous, so in tractional retinal detachment, things like neovascularization, like in diabetic retinopathy, uh, are a risk factor as a congenital causes. And in exudative, uh, we have anything that produces extra fluid. So inflammation and malignancy are two of the main causes of exudative retinal detachment. And when we think about how a patient will come to us with this, obviously they'll have sudden loss of their vision, which is titled the teach. They'll also have photopsia, which is flashing lights, and these are usually in their peripheral temporal vision, and that's caused by the traction on the neural retina, disturbing the photoreceptors. Also be some floaters. Some people describe a visual field defects, like a curtain descending over their vision. And if the macula is involved, uh, then there'll be a severe reduction in their visual acuity, and there might be some image distortion as well. But some of the signs, obviously you want to check their visual acuity. And if it's normal, then referral is even more urgent as they've still got their macula attached and you don't want it to uh, detach. Uh, the sensory retina on slit lamp exam will bulge towards the centre of the eye and it's described as like a hill with vessels, uh, the retinal vessels as being like paths on the hill. And you want to look for any associated tear. So here we have a picture of a reg regmatogenous retinal detachment, the superior temporal aspect of the retina. You can see it looks a bit like a hill with the path going over it, like we just said. So this is usually a clinical diagnosis made by the ophthalmologists. Uh, but if you're unsure about the diagnosis, an ultrasound scan or optical coherence tom tomography, uh, which is similar to ultrasound for eye, uh, looking at the retina, can be used to make the diagnosis. And obviously things like exudative uh, retinal detachment are often associated with an underlying cause, so you want to look for that as well. The management of retinal detachment, you want to send them immediately to ophthalmology to have a split lamp exam and a full review. Uh, and you, any small breaks in the retina can be treated with a laser. Uh, but the mainstay of retinal detachment treatment is surgery. And surgery will be performed more urgently if the retinal detachment is macula on. So if the macula is still attached to the underlying epithelium, surgery will be performed more urgently uh, in an attempt to save that macula. So what are the different surgical options? So if we draw the eye with the retinal detachment here, you can see the retinal detachment at the top. The first option we have is something called a scleral buckle. And this is when you place a silicon sponge uh, around the globe of the eye at area of the break. So we place it above and below here. And this indents the sclera and kind of brings it together to push the uh, retina back on. And this might be done with a vitrectomy as well, where you remove the vitreous humor. So if you draw another eye with another retinal detachment, we'll show another type of surgery. There we go, there's another detachment in a different place this time. This one's more posteriorly. And this is one called a pneumatic retinoplexy. And in this, you inject air into the globe over the break, and that causes sort of tamponades against the retina. And you can do this with silicon as well, along with a vitrectomy. And that allows any extra fluid to be reabsorbed, and the bubble itself is gradually resorbed over the weeks to months. You see that kind of presses the retinal detachment against the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. And with this you need to maintain a certain posture to allow the bubble to press against it so the patient could be lying in sort of odd positions. And if we move on to the prognosis, so untreated this usually leads to a blind eye, but if it is treated then you've got an excellent outcome with sort of around 80% of people having an anatomical reattachment after one operation and 95% with two procedures. And as I said before, a macula on 
uh, retinal detachment has a better prognosis than a macular off for the central visual acuity. So now we'll move on to looking at central retinal artery occlusion. And to look at that, first of all, we'll look at the blood supply to the retina. So it begins with the internal carotid artery, which gives off the ophthalmic artery as one of its branches. The ophthalmic artery then gives off two different branches, one of them being the ciliary arteries, which then go on to the choroid of the eye, and they supply the retinal pigment epithelium and the photoreceptors. So that's the layer that lies underneath the retinal pig pigment epithelium that we saw earlier. The other branch of the ophthalmic artery is the central retinal artery. And this is the artery that emerges from the optic disc, dividing into four different branches which supply the neural retina. And they're the branches that you can see uh, on fundoscopy. And having these two different blood supplies means that the different layers of the retina can be affected differently depending on how the vasculature is affected. So a more proximal emboli will lead to loss of the entire retina, while a distal emboli will only affect that particular area of neural retina. And we're looking at central artery occlusion, so this is occlusion of the artery before it branches across the retina as it emerges from the optic nerve, and that leads to a complete hypoxia of the neural retina. And this is usually caused by an embolus. So there are a number of risk factors for this condition. Uh, anything that causes emboli uh, increases the risk, things like carotid disease, atrial fibrillation, valvular disease and aortic disease. There's also uh, risk factors such as atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, inflammatory disease such as giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, thrombophilia, combined oral contraceptive, uh, raised intraocular pressure and trauma, and most people are over 60. So the patient will present with unilateral sudden loss of vision, and this will be painless. Usually the vision is reduced to counting fingers or even worse. And there are a number of signs associated with the condition. So you get a pale retina with attenuation of the vessels, known as trucking. A cherry red spot, uh, which is caused by the macula, which has been supplied by the underlying choroid. Uh, and a relative afferent pupillary defect. You should also examine them for carotid bruise, any murmurs, atrial fibrillation, and check their blood pressure, and exclude giant cell arthritis. So this is a montage fundus photograph of the left eye and it shows you the pale retina and the cherry red spot in the centre of the macula as a result of the underlying choroid which supplies the macula uh, still being intact as it's supplied by the ciliary arteries rather than the retinal arteries. And again, central retinal artery occlusion is normally a clinical diagnosis but optical coherence tomography and fluorescein angiography can be used if diagnosis is unsure. And to manage the condition, you need an urgent same-day referral to ophthalmology. And treatment is split into treating the affected eye and treating the unaffected eye. So starting with the affected eye, we want to try an ocular massage and attempt to dislodge any clot. Lower the intraocular pressure with acetazolamide. And consider paracentesis of the anterior chamber, which is commonly used but has little evidence and some hospitals perform thrombolysis into the arteries of the eye. And again, there's ins insufficient evidence for this in uh, systematic review, but it is commonly done. And then to protect the unaffected eye from having a uh, occlusion of the retinal artery, uh, you want to look for the underlying cause. So if there's any giant cell arteritis given systemic steroids, and then try aspirin or any other anticoagulation uh, to prevent a stroke, which can be indicative of a risk factor for stroke. And you have to treat any other risk factors as well, such as sm uh, stopping smoking, treat diabetes and control hypertension. And the prognosis for central retinal artery occlusion, 94% uh, of people who are counting fingers at presentation, so they've got really reduced visual acuity, around a third show some improvement either with or without treatment. And 16% of patients have neovascularization of the iris, which brings the associated risk of a neovascularization glaucoma. So now let's look at central retinal vein occlusion. 
So again, retinal vein occlusions are divided into central and branch occlusions, and they usually occur by thrombus formation. There are other diseases, uh, such as external compression from intraocular pressure, or diseases of the vein wall can cause occlusion of the veins as well. So a blockage in the vein causes backing up of blood, and that leads to hypoxia, which leads to leaking of the blood and its constituents out of the vessel walls. You get further stagnation and then worsening hypoxia, and you get this vicious cycle of hypoxia and blood backing up. And if hypoxia is present, it causes the release of VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, similar to in diabetic retinopathy, and this causes neovascularization of the retina. So moving on to risk factors, these are quite similar to central retinal artery occlusion. Again, you've got increasing age. You've also got any cardiovascular risk, so things like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, smoking and obesity. Raised intraocular pressure, as we said, can cause external compression of the veins. Hyperviscosity syndromes, such as in myeloma, and thrombophilia as well. So if we look at presentation now, this is different depending on whether the retinal vein occlusion has caused ischemia or not. So in non-ischemic retinal vein occlusion, you get sudden unilateral painless loss of vision, or blurred vision, and you might have a, a mild relative afferent pupillary defect. And this contrasts to ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, where there is severe sudden loss of vision, and a marked relative afferent pupillary defect, rather than the mild loss and mild defect in non-ischemic. And the signs are similar for both, though they get more severe in ischemic. So in both of them, you get flame hemorrhages and dot and blot hemorrhages, which it bleeds into different layers of the retina. I have a picture of in a minute. You get mild disc edema in non-ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, but it's much more marked in ischemic central retinal vein occlusion. And with the ischemia in ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, obviously, you get cotton wall spots. So this slide compares non-ischemic and ischemic central retinal vein occlusion. So you can see flame hemorrhages, which is the widespread hemorrhages throughout the retina in both images. Uh, if you look closely, you can see some dot and blot hemorrhages, which are much smaller and just look like ink blots on the retina. You can see, if you look at the optic disc in the two, it's much clearer in non-ischemic than it is in ischemic, and that's because of the edema that comes on with central retinal vein occlusion when it's ischemic. So if we move on to the management, again you need an urgent referral to ophthalmology, and if the intraocular pressure is raised you need to lower it with either drops or acetazolamide. If there's neovascularization of the retina, or it's high risk for neovascularization, so there's some ischemia, and to do panretinal photocoagulation, again similar to diabetic retinopathy. You have to treat any underlying medical conditions, so hypertension or diabetes, stop them smoking and so on. And there may be an option of using anti-VEGF treatments. Um, this would be off license. Uh, but Lucentis, which is a type of anti-VEGF, is now licensed for the treatment of macular edema secondary to central retinal vein occlusion. So that's only if there's macular edema in the presence of central retinal vein occlusion. So that was central retinal vein occlusion. Let's move on now to look at vitreous hemorrhage, which is bleeding into the vitreous humor at the back of the eye. So if we start off by drawing the eye here, and then the vitreous chamber at the posterior aspect of the eye, and fill that with some vitreous jelly there, and we can talk about the pathology of vitreous hemorrhage. So I'll draw some vessels, over the normal vessels overlying the retina there. So vitreous hemorrhage can occur for a few reasons. One of these is rupture of normal vessels of the surface of the retina. This can be in posterior vitreous detachment, retinal detachment, or central retinous vein occlusion. So these rupture and they bleed into the vitreous humor, causing the hemorrhage. Then we can draw some neovascularization growing into the vitreous humor. Uh, and this is another cause of it, so if you have a rupture of abnormal vessels, that can cause a vitreous hemorrhage as well. So we'll draw the bleed in there. This, for example, occurs in any neovascularization, so again, central retinous vein occlusion or in diabetic retinopathy. And finally, we have bleeding from an adjacent source. So if we draw in the choroid there, you can get bleeding in from the choroid or from any tumours that are next to the vitreous humour as well.
and again they can rupture and bleed into the humour causing the vitreous hemorrhage. So those are the three main causes, rupture of normal vessels, rupture of abnormal vessels and bleeding from an adjacent source. So the risk factors for vitreous hemorrhage, obviously there's diabetic retinopathy that we just said, any trauma, retinal tears or detachments or posterior vitreous detachment, other neovascularization, so central retinal vein occlusion or branch retinal vein occlusions, which is more distally, age-related macular degeneration and subarachnoid hemorrhage as well can cause vitreous hemorrhage and when they both occur together that's known as Tursen syndrome. And a patient will present differently depending on the size of the hemorrhage. So they have a large hemorrhage, you can imagine they'll get complete visual loss, whereas smaller hemorrhages give you just small dark black floaters which is blood in the vitreous with either a normal or slightly reduced visual acuity. Normally vision is worse in the morning because blood settles to the back of the eye when you're lying down. And if we're thinking about signs of vitreous hemorrhage, uh, they get a reduced or absent red reflex as the hemorrhage obscures the retina. And on a slit lamp exam, you might be able to see red blood cells in the anterior vitreous. Um, I've written chamber there. I didn't mean anterior chamber, I mean vitreous. I'll correct that later. So what's the treatment for a vitreous hemorrhage? First of all, you want to see whether there's an associated retinal detachment. And if the retina is still attached, uh, then observe them on an outpatient basis, and the bleed should be reabsorbed. Other measures, such as elevating the head of the bed at night, allows the blood to settle and that can help you view the retina if you're not sure about a uh, detachment or a break in the retina. Treat any underlying causes and if the hemorrhage doesn't clear you can do a vitrectomy and if you've got associated posterior vitreous detachment and can't see the retina because of the blood you should treat this as a macular on detachment so an urgent retinal detachment and treat it with an urgent vitrectomy anyway. And just let me correct the anterior chamber bit, so it says anterior vitreous. So you get red blood cells in the anterior vitreous. So let's move on now, only two more conditions to go, and we'll look at optic neuritis. So optic neuritis is inflammation of the optic nerve, and in the West, the most common cause is acute demyelinating optic neuritis. And this is a result of multiple sclerosis. So around half of people with multiple sclerosis developed opti optic neuritis. And it's quite often a, a presenting sign of the condition. Optic neuritis classically presents with a triad of visual impairment, eye pain, and dyschromatopsia, which is impaired coloured vision. And the eye pain is usually worse on movement of the eye. On top of this, if the condition is associated with multiple sclerosis, you get UTOS phenomenon, which is uh, symptoms are worse with a raise in body temperature, so when it's hot outside. You also get Pulfrix phenomenon, uh, which is altered perception of the direction of things moving. And this is due to an asymmetrical conduction in the optic nerve fibres between the two eyes. Uh, also the visual acuity, uh, the loss can vary from either mild, so blurring of vision, all the way up to no perception of light and total blindness in that eye. There are a number of signs associated with optic neuritis. So as we said, there's a reduction in visual acuity, which can vary in severity. A relative afferent pupillary defect, because the optic nerve has been affected. Loss of contrast or colour vision, which will be out of proportion to the visual loss. So that's the dyschromatopsia. And when you look at the optic disc, it may be normal or it can become swollen. And weeks after the presentation, there'll be pallor of the optic disc. To investigate the condition, you're going to want to do a full eye exam to look for any other causes and also an MRI of the brain, thinking about multiple sclerosis and looking for any white matter lesions that might suggest it. And to manage the condition, you're going to want to refer to ophthalmology and also neurology to assess the risk of MS. And in the acute phase of the condition, methylprednisolone can speed up the recovery of visual acuity, but doesn't affect the final outcome. Uh, because of the side effects of this drug, it's usually safe for people who need a quick recovery. So if someone has poor vision in the other eye or has bilateral loss and bilateral optic neuritis or if they need it for their job. And finally moving on to prognosis, 93% of people show improvement within five weeks of the onset of the condition and vision continues to get better uh, for up to a year. Though 35% of people with optic neuritis have a risk of recurrence over 10 years 
A thir there's a 38% risk, if you have optic neuritis, of developing multiple sclerosis 10 years after the onset of the neuritis. And this goes up to 50% at 15 years. And this is a much, much more increased risk if there's any white matter abnormality on the MRI scan, uh, which brings you to a 75% risk at 15 years. And finally, let's look at anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So this is a condition where there is insufficient blood supply to the optic nerve head, and that leads to visual loss, and it's usually through the short posterior ciliary artery, which supplies the optic head. It's classified further into arteritic and non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and we'll start by looking at arteritic, as it's the more severe of the two. So this is 5-10% to 10 of cases of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and the major association is with giant cell arteritis, or temporal arteritis. So this does involve the short posterior ciliary artery, and it's vasculitis, so inflammation of that artery. In terms of its presentation, it usually occurs in those who are over 50, and it presents with sudden loss of visual acuity. And in 76% of people, so the majority of people, this is less than 6 out of 60. So it's really, really severe visual loss. It's associated with GCA, so if you have that as well, you get the symptoms with that. So you get the headache, the scalp tenderness, for example, when you're brushing your hair, and the jaw claudication, so pain in your jaw uh, after chewing is the classic presentation of that. Other systemic symptoms associated with this condition include weight loss and night sweats, and also myalgia, and that includes polymyalgia rheumatica, which you might remember is associated with giant cell arteritis as well. So that's the uh, condition affecting your shoulder and your hips, and you can typically get stiffness in those joints. On examination, some of the signs might be seen are a relative afferent pupillary defect, a swollen and pale optic disc. This pale is usually uh, global, it's not, not usually a segmental uh, pallor. You might get some, some peripapillary hemorrhage and cotton wall spots as well from ischemia. And if it's associated with giant cell arteritis, which is likely, uh, then you get thick, tender, non pulsatile temporal arteries on palpation. If you're suspicious of this condition, you want to investigate with urgent inflammatory markers, looking at ESR, CRP and platelets, and they'll all be raised in the condition. You'd also like, need to do a temporal artery biopsy to look for signs of vasculitis. And it's managed with urgent high-dose steroids, usually IV methylprednisolone, and you don't want to wait for the biopsy to come back. If you suspect it, you should get on and treat it right away to prevent the visual loss. Uh, once they've been on the IV steroids for between one and three days, and the symptoms are starting to get controlled, you're going to titrate steroids down to oral steroids. And usually the patients are on these for a few years. If we move on to prognosis, 95% uh, of people have eye involvement of the other eye if it's not treated, and that goes down to 10% with, so treatment really makes a difference. And some of the other conditions associated with this to look out for include uh, retinal artery occlusion, um, palsies of the nerves to the eye muscles, so third, fourth, and sixth and also things like TIAs, stroke, uh, myocardial infarctions, uh, any other vascular conditions as well. So we've got things like thoracic artery aneurysms and mesenteric artery occlusions too. And last we will move on to the non-arteritic form of uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And the mechanism for this condition isn't clear, uh, but it's thought to be some sort of perfusion insufficiency to the short posterior ciliary artery, causing ischemia to the optic disc. So once again, we've got the usual cardiovascular risk coming up. So we've got diabetes, atherosclerosis, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Hypotension is also a risk factor. And this makes sense if you're thinking it's some sort of perfusion insufficiency to the uh, optic disc. And you've also got the disc at risk, which is a term given to the optic disc, which is very crowded with blood vessels. And the disc itself is actually quite small. Again, it presents with a sudden loss of vision but this is usually not as bad as it is in the arteritic form. So you usually have more than 6 over 60 visual acuity, and that's in 61% of people. Usually it happens overnight, so they wake up with this loss. Uh, occasionally it's associated with some pain. So think about the signs. Again, there's going to be a relative afferent pupillary defect, uh, as it's the optic nerve that's been affected. Some people have an altitudinal visual field defect, so it's either the top or bottom half of the vision is uh, disappeared or is blurry. Uh, 
and on examination of the disc you'll see a swollen disc as well and you might see the, the disc at risk that we mentioned earlier, the really crowded optic disc. So again, moving on to investigations, so we're going to want to exclude giant cell arteritis, which we'll do with inflammatory markers, and if they're normal, it's really quite unlikely. And we're going to look for the markers of these conditions, so we're going to check their blood pressure, their glucose, their lipids, do a full blood count, and if they're under 50, think about a vasculitic screen, maybe there's something else going on as well. And once we've decided that this is non-arteritic, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. The management, there's not really a lot of evidence for or any proven benefit, but aspirin at 75 milligrams a day is generally prescribed. These patients don't need steroids, unlike the arthritic form. And last of all, the prognosis. So there's 19% risk of the other eye being involved over the next five years, with an increased risk of this after cataract surgery. There's also an increased incidence of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease in these patients, which makes sense if you think of the risk factors are quite similar between the two, with the diabetes and the atherosclerosis and hypertension and so on. So that's all of them. That was a whistle-stop tour through the main differentials for a patient presenting sudden loss of vision. hope it was helpful. Um, I've got, what I've got here is a summary slide where I'll go through all of them really briefly and just do a quick summary. So if you want to treat this as a kind of a quiz, uh, you can pause it here, have a think about them all, copy out the table and give it a go, and then I'll go through them in a second. Okay then, so we'll start with retinal detachment. The visual acuity loss in this is, as with all of them, sudden. A sudden loss in your visual, visual acuity. You get other visual symptoms of flashes uh, called photopsia and floaters as well. There's no pain associated with the retinal detachment. There are no other symptoms that come on with it. On examination, you see a visible retinal detachment looking like a hill. You might see some retinal breaks. And you want to check if it's macular on or macular off, which affects the prognosis. Remember, macular on needs more urgent treatment to save the vision. And you might find a relative afferent pupillary defect. Thinking about investigations, it's usually a clinical diagnosis, but if you're not sure, you can use an ultrasound scan or ocular, optical coherence tomography to look for the detachment itself. And the management is surgical. Remember the options are a scleral buckle, a vitrectomy, a retinal pneumoplexy, or a tamponade with silicon. Nearly there. Okay, so there we go. So that's retinal detachment, the first one we did. Moving on to posterior vitreous detachment. The visual acuity of this is normal. There's no loss of vision in this. And this, you remember it's the shower of floaters, which is often quite alarming for patients. This comes on without any pain and without any other symptoms as well. Uh, when you look on examination, there might be the Weiss ring, and there might be, or you want to look for, an associated retinal detachment. There's not usually any investigations needed to confirm this. And the management, if there's no associated detachment or any tears, there's no treatment, you just need to reassure. If there's any retinal breaks, then you want to laser them to prevent them from uh, becoming a retinal detachment. Okay, so central retinal artery occlusion next. central retinal artery occlusion. Uh, so again, a sudden loss of vision. There's no other symptoms uh, visually. And there's no pain associated with this. Remember, it's an emboli, usually. Oh, and no pain, sorry. No pain and no other symptoms. The signs on examination are a pale retina that has lost its blood supply. The cherry red spot at the macula as it's supplied by the underlying choroid, which still has its blood supply intact. And maybe a relative afferent pupillary defect. Investigate again clinical, but you can try an ultrasound scan or fluorescein angiography, uh, which is a type of angiography looking at the retinal uh, blood supply if you're unsure. 
and the treatment is to try an ocular massage to try and dislodge the clot, lower the intraocular pressure with acetazolamide, and think about uh, anterior chamber paracentesis or intraarterial thrombolysis, which only some centers do. That's central retinal artery occlusion. And then moving on to central retinal vein occlusion next. So once again, not surprising given the teach, it's a sudden loss of vision. There are no other visual symptoms, and there's no pain again. There are no other systemic symptoms associated with it. And on examination, the retina might show, or probably will show, flame hemorrhages, which are the large hemorrhages across the retina. Edema of the optic disc. And there might be, again, a relative afferent pupillary defect, depending on the extent of the occlusion. Similar to the arterial occlusion, you can do an ultrasound scan or a fluorescein angiography if you're not sure about the diagnosis. And treatment, we're going to think about panretinal photocoagulation if there's a risk of neovascularization. And consider anti-VEGF, uh, though remember it's off-license for this. That's very expensive. Next up, we've got the vitreous hemorrhage. So the visual acuity loss in this is variable depending on the extent of the bleed. The large bleed has more loss. Other visual symptoms might be some dark floaters in the vision, uh, which is the blood within the vitreous humor. No pain associated with it, and no systemic symptoms again. On slit lamp examination, you might see red blood cells in the anterior vitreous humor. It's not usually any investigations needed for this. I made the same mistake again there, sorry. Not the anterior chamber, anterior vitreous. Uh, back to investigations, none usually needed here. Usually a clinical diagnosis. And the management is to reassure the patient, consider different uh, ways of lying down, and if it doesn't clear, or if there's an associated retinal detachment, uh, you can remove all the vitreous humour with a retractin. Optic neuritis, remember we said the visual loss is variable here, from mild to no perception of light. Other visual symptoms, there's loss of the colour vision, which is dyschromatopsia. There is pain associated th with this one, and remember it's usually pain on eye movement, but there is also some at rest as well. And we think about other symptoms, yep, we're going to be thinking about other symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Are there any other lesions at other times? Uh, Utoff phenomenon and so on. On examination, there will be a relative afferent pupillary defect, you've lost the optic nerve, loss of colour vision when you use the contrast test, a swollen optic disc, and later on pallor of the optic disc. Investigations, we're going to do an MRI of the brain, looking for any white matter abnormalities suggestive of multiple sclerosis. And we're going to manage it with steroids. And finally, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which remember is either arteritic or non-arteritic. Sudden loss of vision. Other visual symptoms. If it's non-arteritic, we might get an altitudinal visual field defect, but not in arteritic. There is pain associated with it. And other symptoms, we're going to really want to exclude giant cell arteritis in this. So jaw claudication, headache, and so on. Signs similar to optic neuritis, a relative afferent pupillary defect, and a swollen optic disc as well. Investigations, looking at inflammatory markers for any hint of giant cell arteritis, ESR and CRP, and platelets, which will be raised, and if we think it is, we're going to do a temporal artery biopsy. The management, again, is steroids in arteritic and aspirin in non-arteritic. So there we go. Thank you very much for listening to the teach. I hope it was useful. Um, as usual, drop me any feedback. And yeah, thank you for watching. Bye.